the original 1984 Dune is a flawed epic endeavor. And I feel the first part of that sentence tends to overshadow the latter. Ah, welcome, welcome. I'm Steven Assas, geek culture analyst, somewhat extraordinaire, and this video is about David Lynch's, I mean, Alan Smithy's. You know what? This video is gonna be about 1984's Dune, a famously infamous sci fi cult classic based on what is inarguably one of the best, if not the best, series of sci fi books written yet. So might as well start right there. Not with the book, but with the potential confusion about who wrote and directed it. Because there are two versions, two cuts of the 1984 Dune. There might be more around the world, but I am only aware of two major cuts. The first was the theatrical cut, which was written and directed by David Lynch, and which has a runtime of 2 hours and 17 minutes. Severely cut down and reshot from the director's initial final version of around 3 hours. And then there is an extended edition credited to Alan Smithy, which has a runtime of 2 hours 57 minutes. Alan Smithy has been used as the director's name when the actual director doesn't want to be associated with the finished product. Usually as a result of differences between themselves and the producers or studio, the director loses creative control over the project and in certain circumstances there's no sign of the carryall. It isn't answering. can request their name be stricken from the movie's credits. And this is what happened to Dune because of its abysmal critical and audience response. Suffice to say, Dune was a bomb of massive proportions, especially for the time. Atomics! This was a $40 million movie based on a very popular literary IP that had been out since the mid-60s, and it didn't even manage to make back its production budget. And while I don't consider the amount of money someone makes a sign of their success or of their perceived value in society or in their community, the movie's producers did want to make money, and they put together an extended version of the movie which they could sell to TV stations in two parts, this being now available as Dune colon the extended version, as directed by Alan Smithy. Regardless which version you watch, they both suffer from the same overall issues. They try to both overcompress and simplify what is a fairly dense and layered universe which discusses several deep and heavy subjects in parallel while also featuring a lot of characters, most of which have internal monologues. So the amount of raw information that gets transmitted through the written world is way larger than what can be done in a two or even a three hour long movie. Whenever adapting a source material of this magnitude and depth into a new medium, the art theory term for this is remediation. A filmmaker, in this case, has to straddle the line between staying true to the source, which is what is supposed to bring in a healthy chunk of the audience, and staying true to their own creative interests, influences, and direction. I make a point of mentioning this because you, as the audience, need to be keenly aware of this fact as well, and expect to not see everything you want to see from the source material onto the screen or not have them look as you imagine them to look. Since this will be the interpretation of various other people who aren't you. Since there is so much to work with from the source, both versions try to info dump as much of the tangential information as possible via several narrations throughout the movie. So much so that the movie starts with an introductory narration. Which is longer in the extended version. As well as presenting some of the internal monologues of the characters, but both of these techniques are fraught with issues when it comes to how they're perceived by the audience. But possibly the biggest problem the movie has is that despite its length, again, whether it's the two or the three hour version, is that it feels disjointed and rushed. You can tell there are large gaps in the story even if you're not aware of the book. It is incomplete. The third act especially is a clusterfuck, but that doesn't make the film unwatchable. Far from it. In fact, the biggest sin I think the movie engages in is that it's poorly edited. So what is then good about the 1984 movie adaptation of Dude? How it looks, how it sounds, and how well it manages to convey the idea of an alien yet familiar world where faster than light travel exists but society is based around the feudal system. By how it looks, I am referring especially to the visual art direction, in terms of its costumes, sets, and many, many physical props. And this is one area 
where the source material is extremely lenient because while there are the occasional descriptions of a detail or a particular color here and there, Frank Herbert was much more interested in evoking the vibe of a place or thing through world building or internal monologue than describing in detail the minutiae of quotidian things like clothing or interior decor. As such, while we know that the Atreides emblem, for instance, is a red eagle and that their banner is black and green, that's about as much detail as we get from him. In regards to everyone else's dress and attire, we generally get even less than that. The same goes for a great number of things which, when you read the text, are left to your imagination. While in a cinematic adaptation, it is left to a lot of other creatives to interpret and illustrate how they see those things in their mind's eye. And this is a good thing. The more creative people are involved in the creative process, the better the end product will actually be. The entire visual aesthetic of the props, costumes and sets is centered around the earlier mentioned feudal system and its militaristic underpinnings. This is why the Emperor and his men are clad in Napoleonic style regalia, but obviously taken up several notches. Why the Atreides are likewise all wearing military uniforms though much more humble and functional in design to reflect their status of a not so rich major house. This isn't stated in the movie, but you should get this idea from their dress. In terms of music, Toto did a great job at scoring the movie. The end credit song is whack, but otherwise things work very well, signaling the epic nature of the movie from the title screen. Overall, the sound effects and sound design help to bring this alien world of the far far future into focus. But let's dive deeper now into some aspects of the movie because you can't really talk about Dune 1984 in generalities. Talking about the story, I must say it is odd what was added to the plot and what was subtracted from the book. The main thing of interest here is the weirding modules, the sonic weapons the Atreides developed in the movie. These flat out do not exist in the book, nothing of the sorts actually. The weirding way is a type of movement that basically allows its user to move at superhuman speeds, thus allowing them a clear advantage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I think the introduction of the sonic weapons was a note from the producers because they wanted to blow shit up. This was the 80s after all. Because in my mind, having superhuman martial arts would have been way visually cooler, but again, this wasn't my interpretation of Dune, this was David Lynch's. And who knows what types of limitations he had to work with besides the producers. So I wouldn't chalk this up as one of the movie's flaws, rather just an odd choice. The main issue with how the story is conveyed is that paradoxically, Lynch tried to cram too much Dune into the movie. And as a result, there are lots of places where characters say things or act in a weird manner for no apparent reason, because there was just not enough time in the movie to set up all these bits and bobs of the world. For instance, this scene, where Peter gives this soldier an order and does all manner of funky hand motions. For anyone who hasn't read the books, this might seem like really odd character quirks. But the reason for the hand signals is that the soldier is in fact deaf so that he would be immune to Jessica's voice powers, which we discover a bit later in the movie and is also the reason for her being gagged. But by the time the reveal happens, no one will remember what happened to some random character a couple of scenes ago. And even if they would, they really couldn't connect the two without knowledge of the books. One super odd theme is the curious sexual tone of at least the first half of the film. The guild navigators, the test with the Bene Gesserit box and the space folding scene are all different grades of sexual. The guild navigators aren't directly described in the first book. Their description comes from the second book and says that they are like an elongated vaguely humanoid fish suspended in tanks of spice gas. Being humans who have been purposefully mutated throughout exposure to immense quantities of spice. Lynch took the idea of a mutated human suspended in a tank of orange mist and went all out. First of all, I have to say, the design is sci-fi what the fuckery at its best. I really dig it. That being said though, it does look to me like a giant scrotum with eyes with a V-shaped pussy for a mouth. And since I'm talking about a subjective impression here, I have to nitpick that the eyes are not blue in blue, which is the main external marker of spice addiction. 
A human who was mutated through the use of gigantic amounts of spice should have blue within blue eyes as a minimum. The test with the Benny Gesserit box is... Well, see for yourselves. This is the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohim. She's going to observe you. Put your right hand in the box. Um, phrasing? Put your hand in the box. Hey, phrasing! And itching. There. Here is a little... No woman, child, ever withstood that much. Phrasing. Yeah, the less I talk about putting your hand inside the woman's box, the better, I think. Let's jump to the space folding scene. Well, talking about stuff that makes fuck all sense, the space folding scene makes no goddamn sense visually whatsoever. But it doesn't necessarily have to. Again, Lynch's interpretation. This makes it look like the navigators are the ones folding space, not the engines, but that's besides the point. What I think when I watch it is that it looks like it takes place in a dark petri dish filled with sperm. Again, maybe I just have an exceedingly dirty mind, but all of these things strike me as overtly sexual. The portrayal of the Harkonnens is peculiar as well. While they are indeed the immoral, unethical and conspiring villains of the first book, the Baron especially is portrayed as being outwardly disgusting. Sweaty, his face covered with boils, likes to get covered in some dark oil, spits on Jessica and then there is of course the pedophilia. The Baron Harkonnen in the book is a much more plotting and conniving character. Cruel and sadistic, yes, but nowhere as over the top and outwardly repulsive as he is portrayed in the film. However, this looks to have been a choice on Lynch's part. And while the movie Baron is quite different from the book Baron, the movie version works within the confines of the movie. The major story gap comes in the third act, where most of the action happens within Fremen society. We get some quick snippets of things happening here and there, but there is nowhere near enough time spent in exploring all that goes into Paul becoming their religious and political leader it would have been important to the movie story to better explain how spiritual Fremen society is and how reliant their belief system was on prophecies and likewise how both those things are used by Jessica and Paul to leverage their way into their positions of power within Fremen society. This last part is an absolutely crucial part of the book, the manufacturing of leadership. Now, mind you, most of these things I just mentioned aren't objectively bad or bad for the movie with the exception of the lack of development of Fremen society in the third act. They're just peculiar components of the movie that might have turned off and away various parts of the audience. For as many odd choices Lynch made with the movie, like the cat milking, what the fuck was that about? He also made good ones. In certain cases, compressing or jettisoning various parts of the book helps his movie, and there is this interesting contrast of atmosphere between the two halves of the movie. The first half, which takes place on Caladan and inside buildings, looks cluttered and feels claustrophobic, much too stiff and formal. And Lynch goes a long way towards making the audience uncomfortable with what is happening on the screen via the bear. Once Paul and Jessica are in the open desert and start living with the Fremen, the sense of claustrophobia and clutter goes away and we can relax our eyes in seeing the large panoramas of yellow sand. Interspersed throughout the movie, there are lots of dreamlike scenes, which would normally look pretty Lynchian if you aren't aware of the source material, because I have to say, those do a pretty decent job at visualizing Paul's prescient dreams, as well as Jessica's changing of the water of life scene. He treats them differently than in the book, but they do work within the framework of the movie. He stays true to the spirit of the book. And I think that might have been the major overall problem. David Lynch either tried or was ordered to stay as close to the book as possible and that stifled his Lynchian reflexes because I can definitely see this movie being and looking way weirder than it is and it would have been that much better for it. All that being said, I have found the one true reason why Dune failed. Only 125 meters long. 
There have been documented sightings of worms as large as 450 meters in the deep desert. Is it true that the sand can blow at 700 kilometers per hour? The goddamn metric system. However, as it stands now, is David Lynch's Dune as bad as you've heard? Possibly, but most probably not. It's not great, it is flawed, but it's not bad bad. I think there is a better movie in there. A more watchable movie for certain, if you were to add in some extra scenes so as not to make the third act so clusterfucky. There is a fan edit out there which adds in deleted scenes and re-edits things so that it stays truer to the books. And that's cool. And I myself may or may not engage in some Dune fan editing later on in the future. But I'll tell you about that if it ever comes to pass. In the meanwhile, why don't you let me know what you thought of 1984's Dune? Were you around to actually catch it in cinemas? Did you like it? Did, or, and if so, or not, why? Did you read the book before or after or have you never read the books? Anyway, make sure to appease the algorithm worm god and like the video and obviously comment an answer or all answers to the questions I asked and feel free to ask your own Dune questions of me. I've been doing a lot of Dune related content lately and you'll find a playlist on screen that has all of it. I have a Patreon page as well, so if you have spice to spend, please go check that out. I've been Steve Nonsense. Thank you very much for watching, have a great rest of your day, and maybe you'll see me next time.